All right, so I'll just get started. Uh, okay, well, great. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. Um, and uh, my name is Eric Vance. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, uh, my book that I wrote a while ago called uh, Suggestible You. And um, it deals with belief, uh, expectation, and how they shape our world and affect our bodies. Um, and so... Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Sorry, I was supposed to start that and forgot. That's okay. Um, so, uh, so, um, I, uh, so I want to start by first talking about the word belief. Okay, so this is what uh, I, um, I should say. I, I sort of got into this because I was raised in Christian Science, which was. Um, it's a, it's a it's a religion where you don't go to doctors. I didn't go to a doctor until I was 18 years old, uh, and then I eventually started um, experimenting with drugs a little bit, like you know, Tylenol, Bayer, you know, some of the hard stuff. Occasionally, um, you know, maybe a little bit of a I you know, uh, <laughs> uh, shoot, I just blanked on any other <laughs> prescription drugs, uh, and. Um, that was a big deal for me. And I sort of, you know, entered the world of, of, of science and then eventually became a scientist and a science writer. But I always had this sort of lingering um, idea in the back of my head about trying to understand what it was that uh, as a you know, faith healer, I had experienced and, and what was happening when I would pray and then feel better. Uh, and so um, eventually this led me down this incredible rabbit hole of uh, belief and expectation, uh, actually is what psychologists call it. So um, first I want to sort of have you, normally if this was a, a live group, I would have everyone sort of throw out ideas about what the word belief means. But think for a moment about what the word belief means to you. Uh, and usually when I ask people this, they'll say, half people will talk about um, religious ideas, uh, you know, uh, so I get a lot of very, uh, very strongly worded sort of, you know, um, uh, um, people saying things like um, um, ignorance and and uh, and uh, um, um, blind blind to the truth, or whatever. But like belief tends to be associated with religion, uh, and people also talk about um, uh, um, uh, faith in 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 um, institutions and that kind of thing. But I found there's sort of two types of belief. Uh, and the two types, and there's actually lots of types of, when you say belief, psychologists talk about a lot of different things, but I find there's two that's useful for me to think about. The first one is, I believe that when I drop this pen, it will, um, it will um, hit the floor. And that's just like an ingrained belief, uh, uh, something that is so true that it can't not be true. And that's one kind of belief. And the other belief is, um, is something that, uh, that I hope to be true, that I that I want to be true. So uh, I believe the Cubs will win the World Series, but I also believe that there won't be any baseball this year. So, um, but that uh, and that kind of belief is uh, it's uh, it's not supported by the facts, but it's something that you you maybe deeply have a conviction about. And um, and so what I'm going to be talking about today is when the latter kind of belief becomes the former. When something that you believe or think becomes so ingrained, so true that it actually has to happen, like it becomes part of the way you see the world. So that is what I'm going to be talking about today. And that is, gets us into things called expectations. And we'll see if those narrative. Bear with me. I haven't done this talk in a little while. Um, so I may, I may get caught up. Uh, oh, we got a little audio issues. Misha, are we doing okay? Okay, well, um, hopefully it's not my connection. Uh, I think everything, just in case, I may wanna shut some things down. Okay, um, so uh, um, I should say the pictures you're going to see are taken by Erica Larson, who's a phenomenal National Geographic photographer. Um, and uh, some of the pictures, most of them are taken by her for a, a cover story we did for National Geographic uh, on the science of belief. Um, and some of them are taken by me. Uh, you will be able to tell the difference because hers will be the good ones. <laughs> uh, this is one of her shots right here. Um, and uh, so this whole thing began with a trip to um, this woman's lab, Luana Coloca. She's an Italian scientist who at the time was based at um, NIH uh, in, in Bethesda. 
And um, she, uh, she's a phenomenal researcher. She, she, and she was looking at uh, placebos and how placebos affect your body. And she hooked me up to this machine. She was, she was kind enough to electrocute me for half an hour or so. And she hooked me up to this machine and she gave me two different, like, two different kinds of shocks. One shock was, um, it was it, every time I saw a green light, basically, uh, uh, I get this shock that was sort of like, um, it was hooked up to my finger. And so I get this shock that um, it was sort of like a pinch. It was a little zap. It was sort of uncomfortable, but it was a little zap. It was a one on the, on the scale. And the other one was, um, I believe it was a six or a seven. And this was a powerful shock. This was strong enough that my foot would actually twitch. When I got one, and that happened when I saw the red light. So red light was this big, powerful shock that really hurt. It really, really did hurt. Like I was not. It was supposed to be sort of experimental. Like, what can you handle? And I think I they just went further than I should have. Um, and the green light was lower. And then she just went back and forth. Red light, green light, red light, green light, just giving me the big shock. And it got to the point where every time I saw that red light, there was sort of a lapse of like a second. And you just sort of go, oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, you know. And it was just really really hard um and after a while um uh it, you start to dread that red light and then um on the last round she had a few rounds of this on the last round it, it felt like maybe the green light had been turned up one notch to go from like one to two not up to six or seven but definitely you know the, the, and i was actually worried that maybe i had um fry to circuit my my nerves in my pan somehow because uh it was just a little harder um uh and, uh, and, you know, uh, um, uh, so some of the green ones were, um, and, um, so afterwards she came back in and she said, look, you did a great job. Uh, thank you very much. You're very placebo responsive. Uh, by the way, on that last time we gave you the big shock every time. So they gave me on that last run, they gave me the seven every time, but they just changed the colors that I saw beforehand. And what's interesting is when I saw that green light, like, yeah, it was a little bit harder than it had been before, but it, it, it wasn't like, it wasn't much like, and I wasn't, I wasn't deluding myself. Uh, it really didn't hurt as much. Um, my, my, uh, my foot didn't twitch. Uh, I mean, it was less painful and yet they were giving me the full shock. All they changed was the picture or the, the color that I was seeing beforehand. So they're just changing my expectation. And yet it felt like two completely different experiences. And that um, is the classic sort of, um, <laughs> the classic conditioning sort of uh, um, a placebo response that people study in the laboratories. And that sent me down this, this rabbit hole because um, uh, uh, what I learned was that in this case, the reason why I wasn't feeling the pain wasn't because I was telling myself that it wasn't happening or that I was, um, I was somehow convincing myself. It was actually my brain self-medicating. It was actually my brain um, uh, dropping in drugs before I could, I could process the changes that were happening. Let me tell you a little bit how this works. And I don't want to get into too much into the science. Well, actually, with this group, I probably can because you guys are probably all in science. Um, but uh, let me just imagine for a second uh, you burn your hand on a stove and you put your sto your hand in, um, let's say, some cold water, okay? And imagine that pain relief going up your arm, you know, going through the nerves, going in, into your into your uh, your spinal cord, then going up into uh, the, um, the thalamus and then working its way into like the hippocampus and uh, the ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex, where pain is often associated, though it's in a lot of embracing the brain, uh, and then eventually getting to the uh, to your frontal lobe, um, to your uh, prefrontal cortex. And, um, and that's when you say like, ah, oh, yeah, that feels good. You know, like imagine that. And so it's sort of this process that goes all the way up into the brain, works its way to the front, ends up in the front at the end. What a placebo response is, is that almost the same thing, only it goes in reverse. So it starts in the prefrontal cortex, actually, I believe right here, um, and then works its way backwards through those other, the ACC, and these other parts of your brain, releasing drugs as it goes until, um, until uh, you can have the same response. So you can, and, and so there's a bunch of drugs that your brain has on hand. Um, the one that's the most interesting to study is uh, uh, endogenous opioids. Um, and that's because, and the, 
you know, the, the, there's nothing special about um, this flower in the middle of the, you know, the Asian steppe that, that, you know, gives us, you know, poppies and opium. Like the only thing special about that chemical that comes from that flower is that it matches a chemical that's already in our brain. So people might say like, oh, it's crazy that we have like opium in our brain. No, no, no. It's crazy that there's opium in the flower. The opium, you know, having it in our brain is actually the way we do a lot of processes in our body. And the same thing with endocannabinoids. Cannabinoids you might recognize from, um, Marijuana, there's a lot of different kinds of cannabinoids in marijuana. We have those same chemicals in our brain, uh, which is often the reason why we have some of these experiences when we try the, um, the, the, the plant version of that chemical. Um, we also have uh, dopamine. Um, we have, uh, let me see, uh, uh, serotonin is one that people know. Uh, there's a uh, CCK, we won't get into that one, that, that's, but that's a super interesting chemical. Um, but all of these chemicals... Uh, are on hand, people, and, and all people who study placebos call them the internal pharmacy, because these are drugs that your brain has. And when your brain releases drugs, it's much better at it than, uh, than a doctor, because it can target exactly where that, where that drug needs to go, and it can do it very quickly. And in fact, when I was in that chair, the drug was actually being released before I processed the pain. Like, that's how fast the brain works. And, and it's uh, um, the mechanisms... No. The mechanisms um, we're still trying to understand, but the way I like to think of it is um, uh, your brain is 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 very lazy. It, it has a certain map of how the world works, and uh, and if you want to think of it, uh, people often describe the brain as if you want to say it's lazy. People often describe the brain as as if it had one job. That job is prediction. And this, this is how you conceive of uh, artificial intelligence, too. And this goes way back to the 50s and the early days of artificial intelligence. The brain is a prediction machine. And what it does is it creates predictions uh, all day long. Like when you're taking a step, your brain assumes the ground is hard. Um, when, uh, you know, predictions like, I think next year, the, the hunting will be good on the plains. Um, uh, I think the Cubs will win. Like, you know, everything, um, I you know, uh, every moment of your life, your brain is taking the past, applying it to the present in order to predict the future. Like that's basically what your brain does. And there's a lot of other stuff it does, but like, if you want to boil down to one thing. And so what a placebo response does is it basically changes that expectation so that uh, either in some tricky way or just the process of living uh, so that your expectation doesn't match. And what's interesting about the brain is it, it doesn't like to be wrong. Uh, I call it lazy. You can call it, you know, just stubborn, but it doesn't. So it will change reality rather than change an expectation. For instance, you take a little white pill and afterwards you feel better. If you take a placebo pill, rather than having to change that expectation of like, oh, white pills don't make you feel better. The brain will just make you feel better. And this goes up to a point. Obviously, the brain can't just fix everything. But um, up to a point, your brain will just say, look, it's easier for me to just make the headache go away than it is for me to change my whole perception of what a pill is. And that's basically how the placebo effect works. You're just tricking the fundamental nature of your brain, which is prediction, into releasing drugs. Um, there are several kinds of placebo effects, and we can talk about that in a minute. But that's sort of the one that got me hooked on this. This was not the last time that I experimented on myself as in the process of, of, uh, of working on this project. Not even close to the last time I experimented on myself. I, I, uh, I, what's interesting about placebo effects is they are everywhere. Um, this is, uh, I went all around the world um, and talked to lots of different people about how they use expectation, but none of us is immune to this. Uh, whether you're going into a doctor or a shaman or anybody, you know, or a, this um, uh, this guy I'll talk about in a minute, um, none of us are immune to belief and uh, expectations. We are all gullible creatures. Uh, that's one of the things I learned from this. Um, one of the things I found most interesting in this whole process is the theater of medicine. And so this was... Uh, a um, torture chamber, I'm sorry, a uh, massage parlor that I went to in um, in Hong Kong. And, no, not Hong Kong, Beijing. Sorry, I went to Beijing. And, um, and uh, it was one of these sort of foot massage places. And what was interesting about this, a lot of interesting things about this experience I write about in the book, um, is, uh, is the trappings 
of a doctor's office. And these are very important. If you guys think about, um, you know, uh, people who study placebos talk about this theater and you have the costumes and you have the sets and you have the props and these things are very important. People often feel better as soon as they walk into a doctor's office or as soon as they walk into a hospital because they're, they're surrounded by these things that they have either consciously or unconsciously associated with getting better. Um, so if you can imagine going into some dirty old loft and the doctor comes out wearing, you know, like a, a tank top and some ripped jeans and chucks you some pills, like, is that going to be as effective as the whole rigmarole and having the white jacket, which they don't need to wear those white jackets, the white jackets are meant to, for operating tables to show when you've splattered blood on yourself. Like that's why they exist. They don't need to wear them. The reason they wear them is because they communicate a certain um, message that they want they want us to they want us to understand. And this is a very this is a very important thing. So my my favorite part of sort of and 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 this this uh, this um, uh, massage uh, uh, um, uh, therapist um, uh, had this had the same idea. We talked about this and like you know he he wanted to also communicate what kind of establishment he was. And my favorite part of every doctor's office is, is in here is the um, the 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 picture of the body, you know, without the skin and the, and all of the, um, muscles and the, and the bones, because, um, if you think about it, the doctor doesn't need that. At least I hope he doesn't like doctors don't need to remind where the ulna is or, you know, the tibia, right? Like they know these things. There's, the only reason you have that there is for the patient. And sometimes it's for explaining and showing things, but mostly it's just to create that sense that, look, this is, this is a this is an expert. They know these things. They're very clever. You know, trust them. And that's the role of these of these trappings. And, and actually, scientists have studied what happens when you remove some of these things from a doctor's office and how that how that affects your expectation of the healing you're about to get. Um, and so, uh, the theater of medicine uh, exists in many different contexts, and we shouldn't. Uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of different places around the world that that use you know placebos and that think about placebos, but this is not limited to anybody. So these are two um, these are two different theaters of medicine that uh, that you might see. One is at a, a laboratory, a, a anesthesia anesthesiology laboratory at um, Stanford University, and they're studying transcranial magnetic stimulation. And uh, and the other one is a shaman in um, Highland. Uh, oh shoot, Chile, Chile. No, um, let me get back to you on that one. Um, I think it's in Highland, Chile, uh, where um, Peru. Sorry, no, it's Peru. It's Highland, Peru. Um, and uh, uh, who who does smoke therapy? Uses smoke as a way to clean out your body. And what and his and his uh, and his his clothing represents uh, the, the the his family's tradition of. Um, of ingredients for how he uses, you know, how he how he puts the, his uh, his smoke therapies together, and and so when you see that, when you go into uh, into the his healing um, treatment, that tells you that he knows what he's doing, that he is competent. When you see this other one, you see the laboratory screens, you see very smart people. Um, you know, if you could turn around to the other side, you see a lot of medical equipment, um, and that tells us that we're in a place where we're gonna get healing. Transcranial magnetic stimulation in this context for, <clears throat> for pain relief is no better than a placebo. So what you're getting in that, in, that, in that Stanford laboratory actually isn't any better than a placebo, yet we see that and we feel like these people know what they're doing. Um, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to get better here. And it, and it, and it, and it's, it, it shows itself out in the results you get. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this can be, uh, placebos can be, they can be momentary um, relief from pain, uh, or they can be really, uh, really stark, really impressive. Um, this was a gentleman I met uh, a few, uh, a few years ago. His name is Mike Politich. And um, Mike, was uh, diagnosed with early onset Parkinson's in his early 40s, which is 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 rough. I mean, to get Parkinson's, you know, at, 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 I think it was 42. Uh, it's it's not a lethal disease, but it is something that tends to shorten your life and it, and, it, and it decreases your life quality of life a lot. It's a very difficult um, diagnosis for anyone to get, and um, and so he 
uh, he basically spent the next eight years sort of trying to figure out how he could find cures. And he, um, he got sort of worse and worse. And, and by the time he got enrolled, he did a couple of studies. He got, by the time he got enrolled in this study that I'm going to talk about, um, uh, he was, um, he was having trouble talking, trouble walking. Um, people at his job were actually complaining that he sounded like he was drunk all the time, um, because of the slurring of his words. Uh, he was having, really having trouble feeding himself. It, it was, it was getting bad. Um, and, uh, and I think it had been eight years later. Uh, and then he met Kathleen Poston, who was a researcher also at Stanford. Um, and she was working, uh, with a large team and a company that was trying to, um, uh, do a trial of something called neurotin, which they would inject into your skull through a, through a, um, through a surgery where they would basically do drill two holes in your head and inject uh, neurotin into your substantia nigra, like deep into your brain and hope to like, sort of restart the part of your brain that, that, that makes dopamine. And uh, Parkinson's is a, is a chronic deficiency in dopamine. And so the idea was if you get the brain to start kicking out more neurotin uh, or start kicking out more dopamine using the neurotin. And this, this, um, this test had, they've done it once before and it had failed. The reason it had failed is because the placebo effect was so high. So they said, okay, rather than doing it for one year, we're going to do it for two years because no placebo effects can last two years and we're going to use more people and we're going to also keep them from actually unblinding themselves uh, through Twitter, which is one of the problems. The first thing they were able to figure out who got the real drug and who didn't. Anyway, um, so, uh, and then we're also going to have a group of people who are going to get a sham surgery, which they had done in the first one as well, uh, which is those people are just going to get holes drilled in their head, but nothing else. So it'll feel like you got the surgery, but not, you, you didn't actually get the real thing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, obviously he's totally blind. So no one knows beforehand who's getting what anyway, suffice it to say this changed Mike's life. Um, he, uh, within a year he was, uh, he ran a half a marathon. Um, he went hella skiing with his son. He got, he got in a helicopter and then like went off a mountain and, and, and like skied down. Uh, he climbed the backside of half dome. Um, it, this changed his life. Like he, uh, he really, um, uh, he'd be, and for Kathleen, she was like, oh my God, we've, like, we've cured Parkinson's disease. This is amazing. Um, and uh, it's very exciting. And, and after two years, uh, you know, he, he was sort of the proposer child for, for this, this amazing therapy. And uh, unfortunately, when they, uh, when they got the results of the, the experiment back, uh, the drug did not succeed. Uh, it failed because once again, the placebo response was too high. Um, and Kathleen was crushed. She was absolutely crushed because this cure for Parkinson's would not see the light of day. The company actually ended up going out of business because you can't do two of these small company can't do two of these experiments. And, um, uh, and then, um, uh, uh, and survive, you know, as a company. Uh, so it ended up going out of business. Um, and she was crushed because this, this surgery wouldn't be available to people and, and it had cured this guy. Um, then they unblinded it. And what they found was Mike had gotten the sham. He had not gotten the surgery. Uh, and that, that, that incredible uh, recovery you know, the thing about Parkinson's, you know, is it doesn't go backwards. The most you can hope to do with any treatment is to stop it, but it doesn't go backwards. And for him, it literally went backwards. Like he made a, a recovery, which is, is relatively unheard of, um, but that's the power of the placebo effect. And Parkinson's is interesting because dopamine is related to reward. Reward is very much tied into expectation and and, uh, and placebo. So it, it's not like any, and this is very important to understand that placebo is very interesting, but they don't apply to everything equally. Um, some things have huge placebo responses. You know, Parkinson's is one of them, pain, uh, depression, anxiety. Uh, other things don't, um, oh, and <laughs> don't have, uh, 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 don't have um, the same response. So uh, uh, um, uh, if you look at something like uh, Parkinson's, it does. If you look at something like, um, uh, as uh, um, I'm sorry, I have to figure this out. Alzheimer's does not have a big placebo response. It's just the chemicals aren't there. It's just there's, there's, not, there's not a tool for the brain to use. Um, uh, OCD doesn't have a very high placebo response. So the, there are rules and there are, and that makes it actually more interesting because you can study these things. Uh, I've got a great question. I'm going to take that question because um, I'm just curious. And I, unfortunately I can't 
really get a hand count, but I, <laughs> I want everyone to think about whether or not, the question is, did he backslide once he knew he got the sham surgery? Um, and I, I want, I'm curious if anyone would tell him that he'd gotten the sham surgery. <laughs> Most times when I ask you, groups of people that like no one would tell him which shows that most people are not very honest when it comes to these kind of things uh, obviously you have to tell them um i uh i don't know how i would have responded to that uh, i i know kathleen spent a lot of time thinking about how she was going to tell him and then i talked to him and he said i don't remember what she said i just remember when she said placebo or sham and everything else just like <laughs> like i just you know uh what he did. He, he, I, I have a lot of respect for for Mike. I think what he did was he decided that if he created this in his own in his own mind, that he could continue it rather than doing what I would do, which is take a bottle of vodka, crawl into a hole, and never come out. Um, he decided that no, this is something I can keep going with, and he's actually really uh, really done well. I haven't talked to him. I haven't talked to him in about a year, but. Um, but last time I talked to him, he was doing he was doing very very well and uh, had not backslid. I mean, you know, Parkinson's is it's it's going to progress, but it's progressed a lot less, and he's still very active. So uh, he changed his diet. He did a lot of different things as a part of this. Um, but uh, the power of the brain, especially with something like dopamine, is really really um, you know this is not this is not just uh, self delusion. Um, Yes, they measured do his dopamine. Um, uh, it's tricky because there are these momentary spikes that you get with these kinds of experiments. You can't do like a constant um, measuring over the course of two years. They do go in. And um, more often, though, they actually do sort of movement measurements um, to see how much flexibility you have and how much movement you have in certain um, uh under certain circumstances and what you see with Parkinson's, which is interesting is um, when, when you compare uh, placebos, you compare uh, a placebo pill for Parkinson's is less effective than a placebo injection for Parkinson's. And neither of them is as, as effective as the placebo surgery for Parkinson's. Um, but you don't have like a constant dopamine. It, it His brain is probably going through spurts of putting out more dopamine, but that happens with all Parkinson's patients. They, you know, they, they can, they can sort of put out some, but it's, it's not, it's not a constant high level. Um, and no, I don't think they have any data for like, um, unfortunately they, they went bust. Uh, and I don't think they have any data for like whether or not he's like able to keep it higher, but he is able to have more movement. So that is the, the end product of the dopamine. Um, that's usually what they measure for most, uh, most, Parkinson's patients. Uh, there's another question about whether or not what are the ethical ramifications of drilling holes and doing nothing else. That is the name of the game. Unfortunately, the ethical ramifications of doing placebo surgeries are you have to do them if you can do them. A lot of surgeries they don't want to. Uh, knee surgeries, for example, when they when they cleared those, they didn't want to do them because the placebo. They later when they started doing these surgeries, the placebo surgeries, they realized that the placebo effect is actually very very high, even is sometimes as equal to the knee surgery, uh, depending on the surgery. So some knee surgeries clearly don't have form placebos. People don't like doing uh, sham surgeries um, because they do discredit uh, a lot of a lot of techniques, but they're important. And yes, uh, for if you can do them ethically, cancer and things where there's where it's not ethical, you don't you don't do a placebo for someone who's got cancer and might die or a heart disease. But um, if it's chronic, then it's very important. Uh, and chronic diseases where you see a lot of placebo effects anyway. Um, so um, let's see here. This is another, uh, I think this is another Peruvian uh, group of uh, ointments. And um, another photo by Erica. She, she traveled around the world taking pictures of different, uh, different ways that people uh, uh, convey to their patients that they are going to get healing. Um, she also spent some time with uh, Native Americans in uh, New Mexico. And I want to say it is, I think these are Navajo, um, uh, the Navajo people. And I, uh, and this is a, a form of sort of massage that um, uh, is um, uh, that when you talk to a lot of practitioners of these, these, uh, these techniques, they understand the importance of expectation arguably more than a lot of doctors um, 
because this is uh, this is a big part of what we do. This doctor, notwithstanding, actually, <laughs> uh, this is a, a therapy in which you actually cement uh, parts of your spine together for certain back problems. You actually use this sort of cement, and, and you you um, uh, you sort of fuse them. It's not, it's not fusing, but you're actually using this. It's a, it's a less invasive way to sort of keep the keep the spine um, uh, fixed, and it doesn't. Um, not fixed, but uh, well, <laughs> what it's doing isn't clear because it doesn't help perform the placebo effect. Uh, and that the, the the doctor who pioneered this, I believe, is in Wisconsin, um, is uh, very aware of the fact that when they do sham surgeries, they 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 get the same amount of relief as the surgeries they do, and he's okay with it. Actually, he actually feels like it doesn't change the fact that they are helping people, even if it's a sham surgery. Even if he's not sure that it's actually having an effect, he's okay with uh, with doing these surgeries um, with the hopes that maybe there's an effect that can't be seen. Because one of the interesting things about placebo effects is if, if you have a 50% placebo response, it's very hard to see if anything is happening because it's so high. Um, it's hard to know how effective your treatment is because 50% it's a lot to get over in order to see something higher than such a such a um, uh, such a high placebo response, which is why you don't see very many new pain drugs because they have such a large hurdle to get over when it comes to the placebo effect. Uh, same thing with, with uh, depression. A lot of the conditions that are related to high placebo responses are very lucrative for um, for the uh, for uh, big pharma, and so uh, there's a lot of effort to create drugs. Uh, that will treat these conditions, but the placebo effect can be very difficult. Uh, that's why a lot of less maybe ethical people want to get rid of the placebo response the way it used to be. We can talk about that in a minute, the way they didn't used to have a placebo controlled test, uh, a trial in order to create a drug. And um, uh, turned out a lot of our drugs didn't actually do anything. Um, uh, this is another picture of the uh, of the the shaman in Highland, Peru, doing uh, doing his uh, his smoke therapy, and um, and uh, he talked a lot about how belief uh, and how important it is for the patient to have faith, to have an understanding of what's happening. The same way that last guy did. I mean, he you know he he they acknowledge that the the mind of the of the patient is uh, as important, if not more important than than uh, the therapy sometimes, sometimes. Um, this was another uh, really interesting study that I got to watch. Um, and this is another Parkinson's patient, um, but he is having a similar similar thing to Mike actually, but they're actually doing deep brain stimulation. So rather than injecting a, chem a chemical, they're, 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 they're injecting, they're putting in a, um, a stimulator, a little electric stimulator that will stimulate the part of the brain, uh, substantial nigra right here. Um, as a way to get it to start working more. The interesting about this this uh, this this um, uh, uh, surgery is you have to leave the patient awake, and the reason you have to do that is because it's very hard to find that spot in the brain. It's not like it's there's a roadmap, and it's different in everybody exactly where it is. And so what they have to do is they have to uh, they have to put this thing in there and turn it on and see if they can ease his um, his uh, his um, uh, um, his Parkinson's symptoms, and they ask him, "Do they feel better?" And then he says, "Yes, okay, that, 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 they feel feels better. Okay, they, they know they're close, and they know they've got it. But then what they do is they turn off the machine and they say, "How about now? Does it feel better?" And he says, "Yes, it feels better." Well, they turn off the machine, um, so it's obviously not. It's obviously not the uh, the machine that's doing it. It's his placebo response that he's having. And so then they know that they might be in the wrong place. And so they have to make sure that they're in the right place because um, the placebo effect can basically cause them to put this thing in the wrong place. And then this whole thing would be for nothing. And this is one of the things they've had to learn is that you can put these, these things in there um, and then start them up. And it turns out they're not in the right place. And the placebo effect is constantly getting in the way of, uh, of medicine, both in, in the drug companies and also in uh, complex uh, uh, um, uh, surgeries like this. And so he has to be awake and they have to test it until they know that they've got something that actually is working on him and not just giving him a placebo response. Because you've got all these doctors walking around. I mean, it's a pretty intense placebo response, as you can imagine. Uh, it's a big room with, you know, all these lights and machines and stuff like that. And so, of course, he's going to feel like something's going to work. Uh, um, and this is another example. Uh, this is from uh, Lowland or in the Amazon. Uh, uh, I think it's still in Peru with Lowlands. Uh, and this is a, uh, a shaman who is 
conducting a, a, a session. Um, and yes, the little girl is, is the shaman um, in that culture, uh, uh, an 11 year old girl uh, doing uh, smoke therapy gives confidence. Like that's, she is uh, in that culture, she's the kind of person who gives you um, confidence that this is going to work. And, and and the kind of things we look for, the cues that we look for change from one culture to the next in terms of what we want to see in order to give us confidence. And in this culture, it's a young girl um, who she was actually nine when she started doing this. Uh, and so again, the, the theater of medicine, uh, we got to go to a lot of different, this is a, a, a Laotian family in California uh, doing um, a ceremony to, uh, to get um, a man lost part of his soul and, and he was having some physical symptoms related to that. And this was a, a process to get that part of his soul back. Um, this is in Germany. This is uh, um, in Tübingen. We went to Tübingen and, and there's a, a very famous uh, pilgrimage that people walk um, from uh, 50 to 100 miles um, uh, through the countryside to get to Tübingen where there's this, there's this black Mary um, very famous sort of black wooden Mary uh, that people go to for healing and they have healings along the way. And I talked to people who had broken ankles who were able to walk and people who um, had a, a lot of pain and, and also a lot of um, emotional pain that they were dealing with. Uh, it reminded me very much of the community that I grew up in and, and other experiences I've had with the community where people were finding healing together. Uh, and so this is not about one culture versus another. This is all of us. This is what we do. This is, you know, we get together in groups. And, and what's interesting about this and, and some of the more recent research that come out of um, actually where I live now, Boulder, Colorado, uh, I, I just moved, um, is, uh, uh, um, is groups and how groups affect uh, uh, healing. And so they've done these great experiments where they, um, uh, okay, we're getting close. Um, where they'll they'll give you uh, this kind of the same experiment that I got where you have some sort of pain and they'll lie about it. Um, and they'll say, okay, you know, you should be feeling this much, but actually they're giving you this much. And they'll sort of play with what they're telling you and you're expecting versus what you're actually getting. But with this one, they put in a twist where they said, okay, tell us if this hurts or not. Just know that 50 other people said it didn't hurt, but be honest, you know, don't, don't, don't lie, but just know that like everyone else said it didn't hurt very much, but you know, you, you give us your honest respect, you know, response. Well, what do you think happened? Of course, people rated their pain lower. And what they did is they actually did skin connectivity tests where uh, it wasn't just they were saying it was lower. They're actually feeling less pain. And the same thing when they went the other way around, like, you know, okay, you know, rate this pain, but just know that 50 other people said it really hurt a lot. But, you know, be honest, but just know that like, people said that it hurt. Um, and sure enough, uh, people felt more pain. So groups uh, other people, those weren't even real people. Those were like made up people. Uh, and we've seen this in, in all sorts of settings where groups can heighten the placebo effect. And you can actually test that by giving people vasopressin, women vasopressin, men uh, oxytocin, for whatever reason, um, there seems to be that breakdown. Uh, and you can, which are chemicals that are released from around other people. And you can actually heighten the placebo respect, effect, but just by taking nasal spray, you can heighten the placebo uh, effect uh, chemically. Uh, you can also kill the placebo effect chemically, um, so uh, you know get rid of it. So th these are these are not. Yes, we're deluding ourselves, and yes, there's a lot of psychology here, but it's also very chemical, and um, and uh, and there's sort of two forms that uh, uh, that placebos often take. Uh, one is conscious and one is unconscious. So uh, the conscious one, uh, the unconscious one, would be the one we talked about, where every time you take a white pill, it makes you feel better. So basically, you're being conditioned to have that response, and that's an unconscious one. And, and with those, you can actually give people pills, tell them they're a placebo pill, have them take it, and in a large group of people, it'll still work. Even if they know it's a placebo pill, they describe what a placebo means, and they're very clear, it'll still work, because this is an unconscious response to taking a pill. And a lot of people just feel better when they take a pill, and that's just, you can't fight it. Um, the conscious one has a lot more to do with storytelling, and uh, the, the tale that you can spin um, and I'll talk about that one. Actually, my favorite one in a minute. But this is uh, this is in uh, Huatla, Mexico. Uh, I got a chance to go up there with a TV crew and hang out with this guy. This guy was great. He um, he uh, 
he was a big proponent of sticking your arm in uh, ant hills, and I ended up with a giant uh, bunch of welts all over my arm. Uh, and the TV producer uh, who was going to do the same thing for his back treatment decided not to when he saw um, hundreds of ants chewing on my arm. Uh, but uh, the theater and the, the the stories we tell ourselves, and that can be in this context, or it can also be going to a doctor's office where doctors try to explain things, or you try to explain what's happening in doctor's office, it has a huge impact on how you perceive the effects. Uh, this is a good friend of mine doing a, uh, a um, Olympia, a cleaning uh, in, in a different part of that, that region. Uh, this is a different Olympia with the, with the guy, who, uh, uh, Sikhan Apkan, who was, film, was, the, was filming the, uh, the whole thing. And at the end of that particular um, Olympia, uh, it's traditional to spit this water in the face of the, of the, of the patient. And um, he ended up getting a cold after that because <laughs> the doctor had a cold. Uh, so these things don't always work. You know, they, 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 there, there are, there are limits to the, the effect of, of belief. And uh, yes, the uh, belief can affect your immune system, but um, you know, this is, you know, you probably can't fight off COVID with belief. Um, this I was talking about uh, 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 the conscious placebo. This is my favorite one. This is a um, a, uh, uh, um, a Q ray bracelet, which uh, they, you know they can be as much as two hundred dollars, like a five dollar bracelet. That they sell for like two hundred dollars, and it and it cures um, uh, chronic pain. And what's great is that. Um, this is all about the storytelling. And uh, and I find there's sort of two kinds of storytelling that really you see a lot of. And one is like ancient mysticism and one is space age technology. And this guy has managed to do both because he's got space age, you know, um, um, you know, NASA made materials or something like that uh, in, uh, in, a, in a shape that is harnessing the power of ancient Buddhist mysticism. Uh, and it was Buddhist, Buddhist uh, ancient, power yet the guy who started it was actually a fundamentalist christian uh so you know it's a whole mismatch in there of beliefs and what's interesting about that is uh I ended up getting sued by the ftc uh and um and they had many different they had many different defenses one of them was this is really working this is a really thing we have he he, 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 had, he, had, he had polarized it but then he decided he didn't polarize it because actually Kodak has a trademark, my word polarized. So then he said he ionized it, which is a totally different process. But he said, no, no, no we ionized it. Um, it's just a fancy word he, he found. Uh, but he said it was working. He said it was real. I and mean, then after they did a bunch of placebo controlled tests as a part of the lawsuit, he said, okay, maybe it's a placebo. But we put a lot of money into creating that placebo. So we should get paid for that. Like we've paid to do all these commercials and to show this and to create this expectation. So we, if it's working, no one argues that it doesn't work, but it, it works because of the placebo effect. Well, if we created that, we should get paid for that, uh, which is actually a pretty good argument. The judge did not buy it and he ended up losing the case. But, um, uh, and it went to the, uh, the, the pretty high the court of appeals. Um, uh, and so he lost the case, but it wasn't a bad um uh, argument, in my opinion, and uh, you can still buy them today. I think uh, they did not go out of business. They lost a lot of money, but they did not go out of business. So uh, these are, you know, very clearly placebos, but they're powerful and they work. And, you know, uh, and that's the biggest thing that I want to talk about is like, yes, I like to make fun of people who sell these things, but if you're using them uh, and they work, like go for it like that's great it's it, you know I, I we shouldn't be judging each other for having for using them making millions of dollars selling 200 you know a five dollar thing for 200 bucks that maybe though it has been shown that um more expensive placebos work better than cheaper ones so you know uh placebos are not just medicine they are also in sports i think i probably need to wrap this up pretty soon uh they're also in sports uh um, wine um, that uh, if you tell someone it's, uh, a, a wine is more expensive, it tends to taste better. And the thinking now is not that it's you've been tricked, but that it actually does taste better. That um, it's not that you're telling yourself it tastes better. It actually does taste better. Uh, Coke um, does much better than Pepsi in blind, in no, sorry, in uh, revealed case tests. Uh, Pepsi does better than Coke in blind taste tests because you know what it is or you don't know what it is.
Um, people like Pepsi, but they don't like to admit it. Um, you can lie to athletes and tell them they're taking steroids and they're not, and they tend to do very well. Uh, this has been shown again and again. Great research on this out of England. Um, oh, yeah, the other one was uh, Viagra. You have to read the book to learn about Viagra, but um, placebos do not ignore sex. Um, uh, I can skip through this. I also, in the book, I also talk about hypnosis um, and false memories. This is a slide on false memories and how false memories affect your, um, your belief and, and expectations. Um, and um, this is me in Germany, I think, no, sorry, Italy. Uh, this is the decapitated head of Catherine of St. Catherine, uh, also a place people go to find healing. Uh, great story with her. And this is one of my favorite pictures, and I'll, I, I'll just end with this, uh, because I was raised in Christian science, and my favorite thing about this picture that, that Erica took was, um, this is this is part of that ceremony to bring that guy's soul back, and they killed this pig, and, and they did all this other stuff, and it's pretty insane. But I grew up in this crazy religion, too, where you prayed and made things go away. And like I was that little kid, that little kid with the with the iPhone, like yeah, whatever, like souls and we're making magic, whatever. Like I'm gonna play my candy or whatever. And uh, that was totally me. I mean, these things become part of your life, who you are. You don't think twice about them, even you know, even in some what we you know other people might consider very wild contexts. Um, you know, this becomes who you are and how you see the world. And that's what I grew up with. Is that in the case of Christian Science, that reality doesn't exist, and that you can change everything with your mind. Um, and uh, uh, and so while that might not necessarily be true, uh, there is an element of that that is true. Um, and the important thing to take from it is the, uh, the way that we, we, we treat each other and the way that we engage with, uh, with our patients, if we're doctors or uh, our doctors for patients. So thank you very much. Uh, that is, uh, I could have spent a lot more time talking about hypnosis and uh, false memories uh, and some other things, but let's take some questions and... Um, uh, talk about belief a little bit. Let's we'll pretend like you're applauding. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Huh? All right. I have not done this before, so okay. We have um, yes, yes. So the there's a question about uh, standard of care. No, you do not have to do that for placebo groups. Uh, you do for certain conditions, not for all conditions. No, you, uh, for many conditions, if it's a chronic condition, if it's something where you're not going to see um, long-term uh, problems, you, you, do, you can give straight placebos. Um, my doctor did a half a dozen ADHD medication with me and she didn't uh, see, so, so, I'm sorry, I don't know if I read this. I wonder, my doctor tested about half a dozen ADHD medication with me and none had the effect on me until we got to, <sighs> Methyphenidate, should this be, uh, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, that's the thing. So there's, I didn't get to get into this, but there's this really big area of study, which is why do some people have placebo effects and other people not? Um, and this is a huge question. And uh, and people have tried to answer this question actually for a long time in some very weird ways. Uh, you know, maybe it's gender. Maybe it's age, maybe it's race in one case, uh, maybe it's personality type, uh, and none of these things were kept. The problem with placebo effects is actually you can do these experiments where you do the placebo effect, or do the experiment, get a bunch of placebo people, get rid of them, do the experiment again, and more placebo people just come out of nowhere. Um, so who are these people that are like ruining medicine <laughs> in, in the eyes of the people who make medicine? Like all they want to do is get rid of these people. Uh, on the other hand, you know these people are getting better. On their own so they're actually very lucky uh what who are these people um and it's no one's ever been able to really work out who they are until until recently they're starting to find some genes that seem to be related to these things one of them is the classic Compt gene it's the warrior warrior gene um and you the the people who uh are I think they're the warriors. I, I don't remember how that broke down. It's not a very good description, uh, but it's uh, the people who have more dopamine in their system who tend to be more effusive um, uh, are the ones who, there's been a lot of personality studies with COMPT, gene C-O-M-T. Um, uh, and um, that particular gene, along with about, oh shoot, I think they're up to a couple dozen now uh, that they've found, uh, and, and they're hoping to get up to, you know, uh, 30, I think, 30-something, 30 uh, and they're hoping to get up to the hundreds of genes that are related, but some of them are really, really powerful related to, to, um, to um, 
to placebos. So maybe it's genetic. Uh, why don't you have it? I don't know. Maybe you, you, can, do, you can do your your 23andMe and see if you have that gene. Uh, I have tested, I have checked all my friends who've done 23andMe to see who has the right genes that line up to make them placebo responders. There was only one of them who had all of them. I hate to break in, but I'm afraid yeah. that's time. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Feel bit, okay. Uh, and then I'll have to leave the last question then. Um, but, uh, oh, can I, can I comment on the last question? I guess we can run one last thing. Yeah. Yeah. Run last thing. There's a question about, about my Christian science upbringing, how it does affect my beliefs today. Uh, I am not a Christian science anymore. I use medication. I'm, uh, my kids got all his shots. Um, uh, what I do think is interesting about Christian science though, is that Christian science believes that you have already been healed. You just can't see it. Um, a lot of a lot of prayer uh, religions sort of believe that you can change your body by healing it. Christian Science believe that it's already healed; you just can't see it. And I think that's really interesting because that triggers expectation a lot better than hoping that something will change your body. Thinking that it's already done, and you just need to see it because you're already creating the expectation that it's there. So I think it's very clever the way that that was, and it's, it, it makes sense to people feel healing that way because it, the expectation is set up to already be there. Um, and that's what I think. I think about. I think it's very interesting. I've gotten some nasty, not nasty. I've gotten some complaints from Christian scientists who don't love this way of seeing it. But they also, it's hard to step out of your belief system. It's hard for me to step out of your belief system. Thinking my dad is in the beginning of the book. If you read it, and it, a lot of long conversations about this with him because he still believes in this stuff, and it and it, it makes his life better. And there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with going out there and finding something that makes your life better and gives you healing. God, I wish I had it. So I would say, read my book. It won't take away your placebo response. If you write my book, it might. I'm kind of cynical now. But thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Vance.